So our course is a course in knots on the one hand, but in algebra on the other hand. And a main theme of our course is figuring out how to make the translation between the sort of messy, hard to decipher world of knots and knot diagrams and over into the world of algebra and more familiar algebraic objects that we understand how to work with. So this video is an introduction to a particular kind of translation between knotty-like objects that are hard to understand. In this case, those are going to be braids. And on the other hand, algebraic objects that we know a lot more about how to work with, namely matrices. This is the story of representation theory for braid groups. We'll start off by talking about permutations and how permutations can be realized as matrices, and then amp it up just a little bit and talk about the braids. And then we want to answer the all important question, how good of a representation are these matrices of the algebra of the braids that they represent? Can they always detect a difference between two braids that are in fact different? That's what this combination of two videos is going to try to do. Let's begin with the motivation of the six letter anagram that turns the word ladies into the word sailed. We're going to start by thinking of it as a permutation on six symbols. And as a permutation on six symbols, we can sketch out a diagram, a braidogram, if you will, that shows me how to get from the starting positions to the ending positions for those letters. If we choose to give each of the crossings of those strands an over or under orientation, we can turn this diagram into a proper positive braid. We say positive because we're going to just decide for today that every time a northwest to southeast strand crosses over, that strand will go over the strand that crosses underneath from northeast to southwest. So if we remember those overs and unders, then we get what's called a positive braid. If we forget the overs and unders and just draw a standard braidogram, then that's just going to represent a permutation. So the first thing we want to focus on in this video is what is the difference between those two viewpoints in terms of the algebra in the two groups in which these reside. So first of all, permutations on the one hand and braids on the other hand have a set of generators for the algebra in their respective groups that consists of the same number of generators. If I have n strands, or n positions to permute, if you will, then I have a total of n minus 1 adjacent transpositions, in the case of permutations, or adjacent twists of positive orientation, in the case of positive braids. So I have the same number of generators, and they do seem to be kind of doing the same thing. They're just taking two nearby strands, and they're just kind of twisting them up, swapping them up with one another. If we think about the permutation turning ladies into sailed uh, over here, then those adjacent transpositions are indexed sigma 1 through sigma 5. The, they're, the, they're like the five gutters in between the six strands going from top to bottom. And every time we cross over one of those gutters, that is the transposition that we're using. So for example, if we read this from top to bottom, we're crossing over the third gutter, and then the fifth, and then the fourth, and so on down the line. And so the word using the generators of the permutation group in the Coxeter presentation that represents this braidogram from ladies into sailed is sigma 3, sigma 5, sigma 4, sigma 5, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 1. And because my diagram is exactly the same over here in braid land, it just happens to have over and under crossings here with the northwest to southeast always passing over the northeast to southwest strand, giving us what's called the positive orientation at each of those crossings. But the the crossings are arranged in the same order for my braid as they were for this permutation. So I'm trying to make as much about these two diagrams look almost the same as we can so that we can really spot those differences in viewpoint when they arise. So the braid word that I'm using to describe this braid over here on the right and the braidogram or permutation word that I'm using to describe this permutation on the left are exactly the same word because they've used the same alphabet of generators in both cases and we've arranged them in the same order. So if I want to understand the algebra in these two settings uh, using objects that are more familiar to work with, one of the most powerful kinds of algebraic object that we learn how to work with in the math curriculum are matrices or linear transformations. So in linear algebra, we learn how matrices can be used to represent transformations of vector spaces. And when we multiply those matrices together, we get compositions of the resulting linear transformations one with another. Um, and it's a really, really powerful set of tools. So anytime we can live in matrix land, we can do a lot. So what we'll do today 
is talk about representations. And representations are nothing more than ways of assigning a matrix to each element of a group in a particular way so that those matrices capture some of the behavior and the interactions of the elements of that group. So it's a bunch of matrices that sort of walk and talk like the elements of the group did. So as an example, if I just take this very first permutation that's happening, this very first transposition on the way from ladies down to sailed. I'm trading the uh, the third strand with the fourth strand. It's the move called sigma three. And in the word ladies, it's swapping the D with the I. How could I represent that using some kind of simple matrix operation? Well, this looks an awful lot like in the XY plane. If I'm going to reflect the XY plane over the line, y equals x, the diagonal line. When I reflect over the diagonal line y equals x, the effect is that the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of my ordered pairs just flip-flop. And that's exactly what looks like is happening here. The d and the i are just trading places. So it takes xy and turns it into yx. We can represent that by multiplication by the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. Check that if I do this multiplication, across the row and down the column, 0, 1 dotted with di is going to give me i, 1, 0 dotted with di is going to give me d. So that matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, is the secret sauce. It, it is what tells me, take my two coordinates and just flip-flop them. So that little 2 by 2 matrix is going to be the building block of representations for my permutation group. How do I put it into context? How do I tell, for example, that it's actually the third and the fourth strands that I want to swap and not the first and second or the fifth and sixth or whatever? The way I do that is I need to make a six by six matrix that's capable of operating on all six coordinates of a, a vector, like the vector of letters in the word ladies, right? And then I need to tell it that I'm only operating on the third and the fourth, but I'm leaving the first and second alone and I'm leaving the fifth and sixth alone. What I do is set up what's called a block diagonal matrix. So this block diagonal matrix is made up of zeros everywhere except along this main diagonal. And on that main diagonal here in the middle, in the third and fourth rows and columns, I'm going to put my 0, 1, 1, 0, so that the third and fourth coordinates of this vector are being operated upon, swapping the D with the I. And the other places on the diagonal, I want to put in an identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1, to convey that, in fact, we are not doing anything with the symbols in the first and second position or the symbols in the fifth and sixth position. So this new six by six matrix, we have zeros everywhere that I've left blank, is a block diagonal matrix that can represent the transposition of the third and fourth position in this anagram while leaving all the other positions alone. So that will be the six by six matrix that we will use to try and represent sigma three, that swap of the third position with the fourth position in the permutation group. Let's check and see whether that really does sort of walk and talk and quack like the element sigma 3 does inside of the permutation group. First, let's check that the order is correct. Every generator of a permutation group has order 2. After all, it's just a transposition. When I do a transposition of adjacent strands once and then do it again, I end up exactly back where I started. So this matrix that I write down to represent sigma 3, this matrix should also have order 2. If I multiply this matrix by itself, I should get an identity matrix. And indeed, even just by looking at the little block that's generating this transposition on the diagonal, if I square that matrix, multiply it by itself, you can check that we do indeed get an identity matrix. So sigma 3 times sigma 3 gives me the identity uh, uh, element in my group. And at the level of the matrices, the matrices I'm using to represent sigma 3 also multiply to the identity matrix when I multiply them by themselves once. Right? So they are order two as well. So this matrix does behave just like sigma three does at the level of order. We can also check that the rest of the relations which define the Coxeter presentation of permutation groups are also satisfied by the matrices which I create using this block diagonal strategy of putting my swapping matrix 0, 1, 1, 0 in the appropriate place along my block diagonal with identity matrices everywhere and zeros everywhere else. You can check that the disjoint strand relations hold for those and that the skein relations for adjacent transpositions also hold. And so if you believe all of that, then it means that I should be able to build a 6 by 6 matrix just by taking the 6 by 6 matrices we get from each of these generators and just multiplying them all together. For example, sigma 3 is given by this red matrix in this representation. Sigma 5 is given by this green matrix. So I put the, the swapping block down here in the 5th and 6th rows and columns 
which aligns with what we wanted in the diagram, right? And if I multiply those two together, I'm going to get a matrix that looks like this, that's going to represent the product of sigma 3 with sigma 5. If I keep going and I multiply all of these things together, I'm going to get one giant matrix, which in this example is just going to have a bunch of ones and zeros in it. And that matrix, we think, is going to be a perfect representation of what this permutation accomplishes as an element of the permutation group. So this gives us a nice recipe. If you hand me a word, right, spelled out with the alphabet of adjacent transpositions as the generators of the Coxeter uh, presentation of the permutation group, then I can take the associated 6 by 6 matrices, multiply them all together, and produce a single 6 by 6 matrix that represents that whole permutation, that whole bradygram. So if that's the story for permutations, how is the story different for braids? What when we think about braids which have over and under orientations at their crossings, what do we need to change in order to adapt to the strategy we used here, which was built largely out of this magic little 2 by 2 block matrix 0, 1, 1, 0 that achieved a swap of those two positions? Um, what do we have to change in order to apply that same kind of strategy for braids instead of for uh, permutations? What's going to take the place of that 0, 1, 1, 0 magic block? Well, notice that the relations that we have in the braid groups completely agree with the relations that we have in the permutation groups, with exactly one exception. Disjoint strands, so twists of disjoint strands in a braid, commute just like they did in the braidogram permutation group. So the disjoint strand relations are exactly the same for braids as they were for permutations. Likewise, the skein relations for braids are exactly the same as they were for permutations. So nothing is different there. The biggest difference between braids and permutations, in fact, the only difference in these two presentations, the Coxeter presentation for the permutation groups on the one hand, and what's called the Artin presentation for the braid groups on the other hand, the only difference is right there. The difference is that whereas the permutations transposition elements had order two, if I transpose once and then I transpose again, I get back to the identity, the same is not true for braids, if I give a positive twist to a pair of adjacent strands, and then I give another positive twist to that pair of adjacent strands, I don't undo the first twist that I did. I end up with two positive twists in it. So in fact, the generators of the art and braid groups do not have order two like the permutation group. Rather, they have infinite order. I can keep on twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting, and I'm never going to undo that twist just by continuing to twist in the same positive orientation. That is the important difference between these two groups. So how can we adapt our representation strategy in a way that lets us keep the relations that are still true in the braid groups, the disjoint strand relations and the, strand and the skein relations, but then drop the order two relation that we had in the Coxeter presentation of the permutation group in favor of the infinite order that the generators of the braid group have. So here's the idea. It's a super cool idea. Um, and the idea is as follows. If we start with the permutation viewpoint, right? That matrix, that little block, 0, 1, 1, 0. What does it do? Well, I want to introduce you to a, a, a character whose name is Vaughn Jones. He's right behind me here. Um, Vaughn Jones was a mathematician um, who we just lost this year uh, in the year 2020. He's also a Fields medalist. Uh, he was the recipient of mathematics top prize uh, in our field for, in large part, for the work that he did uh, on knot theory and in algebra. Um, and so Vaughn Jones sort of formulates this process we're about to do like this. If we think about this swapping matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, what does it do? Well, imagine I'm bowling a bowling ball down the bowling alley and I sort of do a bad job like my five-year-old twins do when they go bowling and they throw the ball and it sort of goes over to the other lane that's next to us, right? In the original viewpoint, that swap happens with 100% probability, right? So when my bowling ball goes across the lane, it absolutely ends up in the other lane. So with 100% probability, it switches lanes in the permutation viewpoint, right? And with 0% probability, it stays in the same lane once it tries to, to cross over to the lane that's adjacent to it, right? So what we'll do in order to get us to the braids viewpoint is we'll just tweak this a little bit. Right? And instead of saying that for sure my bowling ball is going to switch lanes when it's, you know, when it hits the gutter on that side, we instead assign a probability to its switching lanes. 
probability that could be a number between 0 and 1. So maybe it's 1 for 100%. Maybe it's 0. It doesn't switch lanes at all. Maybe it's something in between. So we call that probability a variable. We call it t. And so we say every time we encounter one of these positive crossings, we're saying there's a t times 100% chance that the bowling ball is going to skip over into the next lane. And there's a 100 minus t percent chance that it's actually going to rebound back into the lane that it started in. So what that does is it sort of tweaks my matrix. Right? Whereas it started as 0 and 1 in the top row, I've replaced it with expressions, 1 minus t and t, which when t is equal to 1, this just gives me my original swapping matrix. You know, so surely my bowling ball switches lanes when it when it gets thrown over into the gutter, right? Um, but also now provides for some variation, right? So if t is not equal to 1, uh, then this matrix isn't exactly the same as the swapping matrix that we had over here. So that's Von Jones' bowling ball metaphor uh, for how all this works. And again, anytime we want to get from braid land into permutation land, all we need to do is just replace the value of t by the number 1. And we're back into the land of, of permutations instead of braids. So that's always a way that we can get back home after we have pushed this envelope. So we're going to take this matrix, 1 minus t, t, 1, 0. This is going to be my building block. So if I want to build a matrix representing this braid word, what I'm going to do is just use that same strategy we did before, but using this 2 by 2 block that now has variables in it to start building my matrices. Sigma 3 is going to look like that. Sigma 3 times Sigma 5 is going to look like that with a block in the 5th and 6th columns and rows, and so on and so forth. Sigma 4 is going to have that block in the 4th and 5th columns and rows. And so if I go through and I do that whole gigantic matrix product, I'm going to get a 6 by 6 matrix. And that 6 by 6 matrix is going to have a bunch of what turn out to be polynomial expressions in the variable t in all of its entries. And the reason that we have polynomials here is that we have a positive braid. We never had to use the inverse of any of my braid generators. But in general, if I had a crossing going the other way, right, northeast to southwest over south uh, east to northwest, um, then I would have a inverse of one of these matrices. And I could potentially have not just a polynomial with t's in it, but I could also have a polynomial that included negative powers of t in it. So those are called Laurent polynomials. Um, so the entries in this matrix are not necessarily always going to have a positive degree. They can have positive degree and negative degree terms in them. Um, but they, have, they look like polynomials in the variable t. And so I get a matrix here that we claim then represents this braid word. And so all of the generators, all the matrices, the 6 by 6 matrices with uh, Laurent polynomials and T living inside of them um, that represent these generators are still going to satisfy the same relations, the disjoint strand and skein relations, that the generators in the Coxeter presentation of the permutation groups did. But the difference now is that these generators now have infinite order. You can check, for example, that if I take this 2 by 2 matrix and I multiply it by itself, I don't get back to identity matrix. I, in fact, get a matrix that has even higher degree polynomials in T in it. Every time I multiply this matrix by itself again, the degrees of the polynomials inside ratchet up and up and up and up. And so we never arrive at this place where we suddenly collapse back down to the identity matrix. So this representation of the braid groups is called the Burau representation. And the Borau representation is going to be the way that we're going to hang on to for representing braids as we go forward. So in the next video, I want to shift gears and ask just how good of a representation is the Borau representation? Do these 6 by 6 matrices, for example, that we could create to represent elements of the braid group on six strands, do they capture everything that's important about the algebraic structure of that braid group? Can we trust the story that the matrices are telling us? And that's what we'll look at in the next video.